Welcome to Ambo TV. Each week we bring you dynamic sermons from next generation pastors from across the country and as always they're bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God and then we discuss those sermons right here in studio. I'm Dean, never ashamed to order off the dollar menu Windsor and today I do declare we are serving up some southern hospitality with sermons from Florida and Georgia and we have some great messages that deal with parenting, prayer, and resistance. First up is Pastor Corey Demmel of Cape Christian Church in Cape Coral, Florida, and he's concluding their relationship series called Hashtag Goals with his sermon on parenting, and he's dispelling common myths parents have and replacing them with some godly truth. If you have kids or are thinking of having kids, pause, don't you know, do it so fast. Maybe you want to think about it a little bit. Uh, this message is for you. Next, we go to Loganville, Georgia with Pastor Dustin Barker of Elevation Point Church. And his message is about resistance. And he discusses how we deal with hardships when they come and how to avoid the small ways in which the devil tries to undermine us. And I mean, does he ever stop trying to do that? <laughs> Lastly, we'll be in Forsyth, Georgia with Pastor Nathan Castleberry at Mountain Lake Church. And he's also finishing up a sermon series they've been dealing with unanswered prayers. If you've been watching our previous shows and his message is about texting without ceasing. And I'll be joined today with Pastor Jordan Poole. He's coming live from Warner Robins, Georgia. He's here to help me break down these sermons as well as talk about the upcoming Hope Conference this month on June 20th through the 22nd. And we'll get back to Pastor Jordan, but right now let's go to Cape Christian Church with Pastor Corey. Let's check him out. So this myth is that my child's happiness is the most important thing, but here's the truth. It's not about happiness. The truth is that our children's development is the most important thing. My child's development is the most important thing. In, uh, in, in, in reality, uh, it helps to think about the fact that we are not just parenting in the moment here and now, but there is a long game. There's a long play. There's something that's going to happen at the end of this. Uh, in fact, we are not just entertaining or tolerating children right here and now, but a great way to look at parenting is we are raising future adults. So it helps to kind of begin with the end in mind. Uh, I am not the first one to think of this. It's not my idea, actually. About 3,000 years ago, somebody else said this. Uh, the author uh, of Proverbs, mostly attributed to the King Solomon, who in the time uh, was the wisest man ever to live, he wrote a lot of one-liners, and he addressed this, and this is what he said about parenting. He said, uh, this is what the Word of God teaches. It says, train up. Say, train up. Yeah. That was all right, but we'll go with it. Uh, I'm going to give you one more shot in a minute. Uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the reason it says he is everything was written in male verbiage and male tense, but that means he or she. It says train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're older, he or she will not uh, depart from it. I really like the amplified version because sometimes the amplified version um, takes words in Greek or Hebrew and brings out all the meanings and not just one literal meaning. And, and so a, a, maybe a better rendering of this is um, train up, say train up. Train up. There it is. Train up a child in the way he should go, meaning teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and his talents. And even when he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. It's interesting. It breaks down this idea of training up, and it starts with teaching them to seek God's wisdom and God's will for his or her unique abilities. Now, listen, you could have six boys, and they all look the same, but we all know they all very different. Every child that was given to you by God has a different personality. God put them on the planet to accomplish different things, different skill sets. They're going to do different things. And, there's, and this is saying our job is to nourish and to protect and provide and train and shape them so that they can one day become adults who are following God and contributing to society. I, I find it interesting. It says train. It doesn't say entertain your children. It doesn't say tolerate your children. Uh, it, it says train. When I think of that word train, I think of a good um, like coach or instructor. I don't know how many of you played sports or were involved in the arts or music and had uh, music instructors or teacher. And, and any coach, I'm going to use coach because I was uh, um, in, played sports. I wasn't good. I wasn't as athletic as I wanted to be, but I tried. Uh, every time I had a coach, they always had an end in mind. They had a vision for what this was going to look like at the end. And, and we called those things games. 
So let's just take football, for example. There, we were in, in about a month, we were going to have a game, and in that game, there were going to be specific skills and specific things that we needed to know how to do if we wanted to have a chance to be successful on that field. So knowing what those were, they would go back to the very beginning, and every day we would go to this thing called practice. Um, I'm sure you've never heard of it. And he would teach us these specific skills, and we would go through these specific drills, and they weren't always fun, and they weren't always didn't make us happy, and sometimes we threw up, and all of those things. But what he was doing was saying, I only have you for a certain amount of time. In a little bit, there's going to be a game, and if you want to have a chance to win or even compete or be successful in that game, there are some things and skills that you need to learn, like blocking, tackling, catching, and throwing. And he loved us so much that when we didn't do it right, he told us we did it wrong. <gasps> How dare he, my self-esteem. When we would miss blocks or miss reads or when we would make mistakes, he wouldn't say, you know what, you're a really good person. Just do whatever makes you happy. Um, and in fact, that's, if, as long as you're happy, it like, doesn't really matter what happens in the game. What he would say is, if you want to have a chance to be good at this, if you want to have a chance to win the game, I'm going to need you to learn to do this. I'm going to need you to teach you how to do it that way. And it works with, you know, it could be a piano, it could be violin, it could be soccer. And what they would do is they would hone in and they would train us to be as prepared as, as possible for the game. And then when the game came, I was always taught, I coached a lot as well, um, uh, I was always taught that practices were for the, uh, for the coaches, but games are for the players. If there was some stuff going on in the game, I could tweak a few things, but really, if I hadn't prepared them, it was a little late in the game. I mean, there were a few strategy things, but most of my work had been done. Well, this is the same as parenting. We have them for a period of time, and there is a game a little bit later. And that game is going to require certain principles and values and worldviews and skills. And we have 3,000 hours of influence, uh, uh, psychologists say, a year to give them the skills and principles and coach them and help them and teach them what they need to know and how to avoid this and, and, and shape them and train them. And then when this game comes, the game is called adulthood. The game is called life so that they hopefully have a chance to win they hopefully have a chance to compete, and they have a sense of who they are, um, and, and that they're, it's not about always their happiness. It's about making sure you're ready for the game. Pastor yeah, so Corey giving us some really, really cool parenting tips. Um, and joining us today live via Skype is Pastor Jordan Poole. Pastor Jordan, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. I mean, look, you provide us with some of the coolest sermons that uh, we have on the show. So it's, it's really exciting for you to be here with us today. Um, so I want to just jump right into this sermon and, and, and talk about what Pastor Corey was talking about. Now, you yourself, you're, you're a father, like myself, correct? That's right. That's right. I have a four-year-old daughter. Her name is London. And uh, she is she's wonderful, man. She's a joy. All right. Yeah, man. Our girls are... are you know, that, that's a thing for us as dads. You know, the girls are always a, kind of attached to us. So, right. so my question is, you know, going back to Pastor Corey's sermon, um, you know, life coaching is a thing. And, you know, so how do you handle life coaching? And especially as being a pastor, because, you know, people of your church tend to look to you and your family as an example. So that's got to be, you know, a lot of pressure. Well, I mean, uh, I think... Uh one thing I try to remind myself of, I heard one time, is pressure is a privilege. Mm, okay. And when you have pressure on your life, there's good pressure. I think that comes from what God's called us to do. Um, I think there's good, healthy pressure sometimes. I think there's also bad pressure that sometimes we put on ourselves. That's like, oh, I got to be this. I got to be perfect. Um, but I think pressure is a privilege. You know, in sports, he's talking about sports in this message, which I can relate to. I grew up playing sports. I love sports. Um and how in, in the critical moments of the game, the most pressurized moments of the game, uh, the, the ones who want the ball are the ones who've been preparing for that moment. Mm. Uh, they don't wait to take the game-winning shot when it's time to take the game-winning shot. No, they've been in the gym several hours, several weeks, working on that one shot when nobody's watching. So when the time comes for them to take the shot when everybody's watching, they're prepared for the moment. And when you're prepared, you can handle the pressure. Absolutely. I love it. That's right. Pastor Corey doing a great job at um, relating parenting to something that most of us or most of us guys anyway can uh, can understand, which is uh, sports analogies. So we'll get back to Pastor Corey a little later. But right now I want to go ahead and take a commercial break and we'll be back with more Pastor Jordan Poole and Ambo TV.
Welcome to AMBO TV, bringing you next generation pastors from across the country. We were just checking out Pastor Corey Demo, but right now I want to go ahead and get to Pastor Dustin Barker. Let's check him out. He's just minding his own business, just hanging out. Paul's just hanging out, not doing anything crazy, just taking, taking the, the brushwood, trying to build a fire, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this viper latches itself onto his arm. It was completely unexpected. It was completely out of nowhere, and Paul never saw it coming. He never expected it to happen. And this is why unexpected pain is so bad. If I can brace for something, I can be ready for it. But when I'm caught off guard, when I'm just chilling, when I'm just minding my own business, when life is good, when things are amazing, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I get attacked, that's when it's most painful. This is why the attack of the enemy is so painful. Because not only is he on the attack, but he's a conniver. He's a schemer. So he's not going to come to you when you're expecting it. He's going to come when you least expect it, which is why the Bible says that we should be ready in season and out of season because it does not matter if you're prepared or not. It's like playing hide and go seek, ready or not, here I come. That was like, I hope you're not ready. I hope you're not ready. And, and it's when we least expect it from the places that we least expect it. Whenever he attacks, it's going to be from where we least expect it. And it's weird because we would expect him to attack the places in our lives that we're prepared. We would expect for him to attack those places. You know why? Because it's the biggest places in our lives. We would expect him to attack the areas of our lives where we are most productive, where we're doing big things, where we're doing the most. But that's the exact opposite of the places that he attacks. He attacks the places that we're not doing anything. He attacks the places that we least expect it. He comes to the unusual places. And it seems like that doesn't make sense, but it actually makes perfect sense. He attacks the areas of our lives that we wouldn't even think that there was any reason for him to attack. That there's no reason for him to come against it. But it makes perfect sense. Because those areas where we're not doing a lot are the areas where we're least protective. See, the areas where you're doing a lot of great things for God, those are the areas that you're the most protective of. Those are the areas that you're most on guard. If you notice this, like, like in your marriage, you're guarded with your marriage. You're protecting your marriage. So the enemy doesn't come straight for your marriage. He might come for your job. Because if he can affect your job, then he can affect your marriage. He does not come for the obvious places that we expect for him to come, but he comes to the little places. He comes to the small places that, that we're not paying attention to. He comes to the places that we don't even care about, the places that we're not even investing in, because he knows that those are the areas that we're the most vulnerable. All right, there's Pastor Dustin Barker with the high energy. As always, <laughs> we love Pastor Dustin's uh, content. So... You know, I'm, I'm a worrier. My wife is always telling me, you know, I worry too much, but that's only because of past experiences. You know, I've been burnt before. I've had a lot of rough things happen in my life. So, you know, I like to think I'm pretty well guarded against this, but it also gives this air of like, you know, I don't want to be bothered with people. So, you know, how do we hedge ourselves against, you know, you know kind of devilish works but at the same time remain, you know, open and, and, and good people. You know, to me, it seems like if we're hedging ourselves all the time, we're always building these walls. <clears throat> Absolutely, man. Um, one thing I think about is what Jesus said. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Hmm. Uh, he said, take heart, I have overcome the world. And so right there, Jesus already is telling us, you're gonna experience some pain, you're gonna experience some trouble. Um, I love this story that he's preaching about with Paul and the snake and all that in the fire, uh, because a lot of times in the Bible, you'll see that the fire, uh, fire in the Bible is always representative of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so one thing that I, what I love about this story is that uh, um, the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. And so what I see and what I get from this story is if Jesus said we're going to have trouble, 
Uh, but if I have the spirit of Jesus in me <laughs> that raised that raised him from the dead, what I see in the story is it was the fire that drove the snake out. Hmm. It was the fire that caused the snake to be exposed in the first place. Okay. Um, and so when the fire was lit, the snake came out and it bit Paul. And the one thing that after this part, after it bit Paul, he shook it off. <laughs> A lot of times <clears throat> we let the snake stay attached to us okay. by talking about it. Uh, rehearsing it over in our minds. Like, I should have said that to them. I should have let them have it that way. You know what I mean? And we start to replay these things and we lock ourselves in a season that was not supposed to be a permanent place. It was supposed to be a temporary place. And so one thing we have to realize, man, pain's going to come, trouble will come, battles are going to come. But watch this. The same fire that drove the snake out was the same fire that destroyed the snake. And so when you walk with the Spirit of God, when you understand that the Holy Spirit is alive in you, that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. So people are going to come into your life, and it may be good relationships, it may be painful, and you might go your separate ways. Um, so I want to encourage people who are watching this, yeah, we have to guard our heart. We have to be protective of our heart because out of it flow the issues of life. But at the same time, remember that we have the Spirit of God alive on the inside of us and that, yes, it might be trouble right now, but you can be trained by your trouble if you'll let it. And uh, remember what Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. Just let it train you and keep moving. Mm, I love it. That's, that's so true. And, and it's such a really, really good jewel of faith right there. Uh, we're going to get back to Pastor uh, Justin Barker, but right now I want to go ahead and throw it over to Pastor Nathan Castleberry, and let's check him out and see what he has to say today. So we're going to open up to chapter 5, verse 16, and it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Really simple recipe here. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. So before we, we, we break this down and, and, and put it at the practical, like daily prayer level, what it really means to pray without ceasing, just a couple of observations that I think we can wring out of this text. It says rejoice always. That's the very first thing it's instructing us to do, kind of as a, as a stepping stone into praying without ceasing. Now, you may be in this room or watching online because it's really difficult to rejoice. One, one thing I've learned as being a pastor is that pain is a good motivator for church attendance. We sometimes come through these doors and see if, man, if I start you know, being around God more, maybe life will start working out. And we have this kind of you know, transactional approach to our faith. And so if life is difficult right now and you're seeing if Jesus can help solve all your problems, you may read a verse like this, rejoice always, and think, what? Like nobody can say that. Nobody can do that. That's impossible. There's nothing about my life circumstances right now that would incite rejoicing on my end. What are you saying to me, Paul? I wanna give you just a little bit of a, a linguistic study on, on what they're really meaning by this word rejoice. See, sometimes we miss things in English. See, the original listeners would have been in a house church somewhere in Thessalonica, and they would have been hearing this uh, delivered in, in ancient Greek. And the word rejoice, the word joy, and the word grace all come from the same Greek root word. And, and when you hear the word joy, rejoice, and grace in the New Testament, what they're trying to tell you is not about happiness and smiles and getting what you want. Happiness is a circumstantial emotion when we get what we want, when our preferences and our circumstances are aligned. That's happiness, that's good. That's like no line at Chick-fil-A type thing, you know? It's a fleeting moment. Joy in the New Testament has to do with a disposition where you literally are leaning on God's grace. So when he's saying to be joyful, when you read verses about the joy of the Lord is your strength, all it's saying is the greater we can have an, our awareness of God's grace in this moment, the greater our capacity is to rejoice even in the hard times. I mean, I love it. Pastor Nathan is pretty much talking about, you know, one of the tenets of our faith and, and that's always, you know, remaining faithful and, and rejoicing is, you know, and we do catch ourselves in times of worry like my, 
you know, my, my bills are late. You know, is there any way to kind of insulate ourselves from feeling those feelings and not, you know, and forgetting to rejoice? I think a lot of it can, uh, I say a lot of it, that's a general statement, but uh, I think sometimes um, we tend to, uh, when you say the word insulate, it makes me think of the other word uh, that we tend to do when we go through trouble is isolate. Mm. Uh, we tend to isolate ourselves. We don't want nobody knowing what we're dealing with because this weird thing happens in our, our ego or something. Like, I don't want anybody to know I'm struggling. I don't want anybody to know I can't pay my bills on time. I don't want anybody to know I'm having trouble feeding my children. When really that's what the body of Christ was meant to do. We were meant to carry one another's burdens. And I think a lot of times if we can all just take off our mask, um, you know, churches sometimes can be filled with the best actors in the world. Um, <laughs> where people just come and, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm blessed, brother. I'm doing great. Uh, but on the inside, they're doing terrible. And, and if we could just really unload that onto some trusted people, um, then I think the rejoicing always could start to really uh, be more prominent in our lives. When you have, you know, you have a brother or a sister in Christ who can stand there and say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to help you see this through. Um, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. I'm going to show up with, whenever I can to help you. And I think that right there can begin to bring some freedom into some people's lives. So I think vulnerability with the right people. you got to be vulnerable in the right circles because some people can be in your circle but not be in your corner. And so the corner in a boxing ring is the most important part of a boxer's team because that's where the the the, the advice comes from that's where the 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 healing comes from if you get a, a jab to the eye well the cut man they call him can come in and start to dark, doctor you up so you can get back in the fight so i would encourage people man check who's in your corner because that's going to enable you to help keep rejoicing and keep fighting all right i love it don't throw the towel in look in your own corner and somebody's going to take care of you in the name of god i love it we're going to be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. We were just checking out Pastor Nathan Castleberry, but right now I want to get back to Pastor Dustin Barker and let him wrap up his sermon. Let's check him out. Why is the devil not attacking the big things in your life? Because he would much rather make you inconsistent in the small things. Because if he can make you inconsistent in the little things, then he can stop the big things. If he can make you inconsistent in the little things, then he can stop the big things. If he can drop something into your heart, a painful situation, unexpected pain, where you begin to feel like you're not good enough, like you don't have what it takes, like you don't have enough, then you can start to think that the grass is greener somewhere else. If he can cause you to think that who you have on your side that's with you, that's fighting for you, that you have a strong bond, if he can cause you to begin to think that they are not enough, then you'll start thinking the grass is greener somewhere else. And if he can get you to think that the grass is greener somewhere else, then he can get you to stop watering where you're at. And if he can get you to stop watering where you're at, then he can stop you from fulfilling the purpose of why you were planted there in the first place. We think that he's just going to run at us with like this big sign. I am attacking you. I am coming against you. Doesn't do it like that. Doesn't do it like that. It's, it's the slow process. It's a slow fade. So slowly we just begin to, to let up off of it a little bit. We, we were coming to church consistently. I'm not talking to y'all because y'all all here. We were coming to church consistently, but then all of a sudden life got in the way and we faded a little bit. We were praying every day, but then we started being too tired at night and so we fell asleep before we could pray. Now listen, I'm all for falling asleep while you pray. Okay, because listen, I, I do this. I fall asleep. Now, if I were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, I would like to believe I wouldn't have done this. But I can relate because I feel like if I'm falling asleep while I'm praying, then at least that's the last thing I'm doing in the day. You know what I mean? But, but some of us, though, it's like, oh, I'm just, I got I to gotta catch the game and then I'll pray and then I'll go to bed. 
fall asleep watching the game. Like, it's just, it's a slow, I'm being very practical. Because if we're not practical, then we begin to think that it doesn't apply to us. But it's the little things. It's the little things. Like, like you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with my addiction. But then slowly but surely, something begins to creep back into the small area that you begin to let up off of. Like, like a struggle with, with something that, that you didn't think you were ever going to struggle with again because you thought that you overcame it. But then all of a sudden, you find yourself alone in front of a computer screen and nobody else is there. And suddenly, you're being attacked and you don't even realize it. It's, it's a process. See, our lives are not the only ones that are processes. The attack of the enemy is a process. Our calling is a process. The attack of the enemy is a process. All right, so I'm going to have to go ahead and quote my wife here again. And I know she's absolutely loving this today. But, you know, she, she, actually, she told me, she said, you know, once you start hosting Ambo TV, you know, the devil's going to come for you, right? It's just going to get even harder for you. And is this... Something that you find to be true as well, you know, because I hear the cliche all the time, like the closer you are to God, the harder the tests become and the more the devil's going to try to, you know, pursue you and go after you. Is, is this something that, you know, you find to really be true or is it just something we tell ourselves in times of, you know, hardship? Uh, I've heard the cliches too, you know, especially growing up in, the, in, in church and especially being in the South, you know, people say new level, new devils. Uh, oh, um, I never heard that one. I like it. <laughs> yeah, a like new level, new devils. And I heard, uh, I heard someone say the other day, "Well, okay, like like uh, the pastor just said, like we give the devil too much credit sometimes, but also mm. we can't give him too little." So when people say these things, new levels, new devils, um, I'm trying to change my thought process, and I, I get where the, where it's coming from. Uh, because, I mean, as you go higher in God and as you are, you know, are experiencing new levels of, in life of, of just blessing and all these things, whatever it might be, that new devils attack. Well, also, uh, I like to think that if there's going to be new levels and new devils, then that means the greater angelic protection I have over my life. Mm. Um, if God's calling me higher and we go from faith to faith, I have to believe if we're going from faith to faith and glory to glory, that in the next level of faith, he's also, also going to have a next uh, new level of provision for me. And so uh, so I can't just constantly be focused on new levels, new devils. No, devil don't like me anyway. Uh, he wants to take <laughs> me out anyway. Like he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober minded. Okay. Like be sober minded, be alert. Like be aware of what's going on and 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 and, and live your life by faith. Uh, so so much fear tries to grip people, and I love what he's talking about about being consistent in the big things. Um, I heard I heard a quote that goes, "Great people do consistently what average people do occasionally," and so being consistent starts to starts to build great things. And we have to I think we have to redefine what's what is big. You know what I mean? So so many. Uh, people think, oh, if I, when I get there, that's going to be the big time. That's going to be the that's going to be the big thing. That's going to be the awesome picture of my life. Well, we have to start thinking like, no, where I am now is big. What I'm doing now is big for God. You know, you might be raising, you know, uh, two kids, three kids, whatever. That's big. You know, if you're a yeah. pastor, you might be pastoring 50, 100, 200 people. That's big. You know, we always look over at someone else who's pastoring 10,000 people. You know, well, that's their calling. That's where God has them. And we have to be excited about where we're at because where we're at is pretty big also, but I'm going to still be consistent and I'm going to still be faithful to where I'm at because I know I can't be promoted. I can't, I can't go to a new level uh, until I'm faithful what I have. And I think about the parable of the talents that right. Jesus told. Right. One servant had five, one had two, one had one. The guy with the five and the guy with the two went out and were consistent with it and multiplied it. The guy with the one said, well, they got more than me. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything with this. This ain't nothing. I'm going to go bury it. And mm -hmm. so he didn't do anything with it. And the master came back and said, you wicked and lazy servant. Why don't you do anything with what I gave you? Uh, don't worry about the guy with the five or the two. I gave you one. Do something with it. Yeah, what you have is big. And so uh, I just want to encourage somebody today, man. What you're doing is big. And you need to keep telling yourself that and thanking God for where he has you because it's big. 
All right, you heard it here. I mean, Pastor Jordan Poole is telling you, stay consistent and stay consistent in your faith. So uh, that was Pastor um, Dustin Barker. But right now I want to go ahead and throw it over to Pastor Nathan Castleberry and let him wrap up his sermon. Now I want you to think about that supercomputer that you have in your pocket. We're all part of some group text that is constantly connected. Am I right? We've all got that group of friends or family that we celebrate the highs with and we complain about the lows with. We've all got that group text that we gripe when things aren't going the way we should or we send the thumbs up emojis when somebody else is celebrating something. We are constantly connected. We may not know how to pray without ceasing, but we know how to text without ceasing. And marketers know this. Have you noticed over the last few years how many more things are happening in your, in your text inbox with businesses and brands and less and less with your email inbox? How often now do you see when you go to a restaurant where they don't just give you a buzzer to let you know when your table's ready, they shoot you a text? How many of you get the coupon updates from like your favorite restaurant, No whenever the kids are gonna eat free? Oh, I got a text update. There's a reason why advertisers are switching to the mechanism of texting as opposed to emailing. And there's some pretty compelling stats behind it. Did you know, when you compare emailing and texting, that only about 20% of emails ever get opened? It's true, right? Like, how many of you like me have got, like, that ghost email account that you never check? It's just what you used to, like, log into things online with. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll like, see a cool promo code when you're checking that inbox. But there's, there's no urgency there. It's just an email. If they want me, they'll call me type thing. Text messaging we feel that vibration. And I think there's like some chemicals get released in our brain because there's a sense of urgency, like I gotta know what's going on. 98% of text messages get opened within 90 seconds of being sent. Emails, if they get opened at all, <laughs> at, the, at the earliest is 90 minutes. That's only 20% of all the emails that get sent. People are responsive with text. That's a greater sense of connection. It's a greater sense of, of, uh, of awareness. And that's why brands and advertisers and, and, and marketers are, are, are migrating toward texting. Um, I wonder if we were to take the amount of time that we spend in our texting app <laughs> and, and when we have that impulse to send a text, what if we just, in our mind, in the quiet of our own little cubicle, and just shot something to God. I said, okay, they're driving me crazy in HR, God. How do I respond <laughs> in a way that would represent you well? Help me. What if you got a raise and before you text your family to celebrate, you just stopped? I said, you know what? Every good and perfect gift comes from God. He knew about this even before my boss did. Thank you, Jesus. Never ending prayers. Constant little text messages between you and God. I think what Paul is saying is that as things come up, surrender them to God first, the things that you need help with, and thank him for the things that he has done for you. So often I just jump right past it and just go on with my day with a total lack of awareness that, that, that God is really the one orchestrating things and authorizing things and allowing them to happen. What I've learned is the, the, the more I increase my awareness of the hand of God in my life, the more my gratitude goes up, the more my joy goes up, and it's all correlated to the consistency of my prayer life. Pastor Poole, really quickly, because we're short on time today, can you give us you know, a 10 second kind of response on how we can identify the hand of God working in our lives? I think just being thankful, just begin to look around your life and say, thank you, God, for the house I get to live in, for the food on my table. Thank you for my family. Thank you for the job I do have and for the friends in my life. When you cultivate that attitude of gratitude, you begin to see what God's done a whole lot in your life. And uh, we'll focus more on him, on what you do have and what you then what you do, what you don't have. So I think thanksgiving and praise cultivates that type of uh, atmosphere in your life. All right, I love it. This is fantastic. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and take another break, but we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, home of Next Generation Pastors. And I've had 
Pastor Jordan Poole via Skype with me, helping me kind of break down these sermons today. But I want to stop and just ask what he has going on at Hope Church right now. Pastor Poole, thank you for joining us. And, you know, what's going on at, at Hope Church? I'm hearing a lot about this festival that you have coming up. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, it's called Hope Conference. It's happening June 20th through the 22nd. Have some amazing, amazing speakers coming in. Uh, Kevin Wallace out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Darius Dan Daniels uh, out of New Jersey and also Orlando. Charles King will be leading worship on Thursday night, and then Israel Houghton will be with us on Friday night. And so it's going to be a powerful, powerful conference. It's for the church. Uh, anybody, you know, who is a part of God's family and those who are not to come and just be a part, get refreshed and have some fun. Um, we try to add some creative things in there just to make it a very fun environment. So on Friday night, after our experience is over, we're having an after party uh, with one of my friends. His name is J.R. Bricks. He is actually a rapper and uh, does a phenomenal job. So he'll be doing an after party. We'll have some food trucks out there. And then we also try to incorporate a health and wellness aspect to it. And so Saturday morning, we finished the conference with a 5K hope run. And we raised money out of, out of that hope run to go towards feeding people for Thanksgiving. And so it's a conference not just to have church. It's a conference to refresh people, revive people, to build their faith, and also uh, help the community when it comes time during Thanksgiving. So it's a really awesome, awesome thing. I love it. And now... Is this something that you're you're doing annually? Like when when did this start? What's what's kind of like the history behind it? Yeah, so um, um, I'm a second generation pastor. My dad started the church uh, 32 years ago. Uh, I'm 33, so you can do the math. Um, <laughs> and so he he handed me the church six years ago. And so up until that point, we had done little things during the summer, but just last year we started. We said, you know what, we're going to do a conference every year uh, where we bring in you know speakers to just come and just uh, bring a powerful word and bring in guest worship leaders and help make our region more unified um, and, and, and bring in other churches to come and be a part of the experience. You know, we don't need anything from you. We just want you to come and enjoy what's going to happen. The conference is free. Like, we don't charge for it. Um, the only thing that costs is the registration for the run that we're doing on Saturday. So I think it's an awesome opportunity. Uh, and this is our second year and we're going to keep on doing it. And I just, I'm excited about it and I can't wait to see what it looks like, you know, 10 years from now, but I know we're only in the beginning stages of it, but it's, it's already moving and got some great momentum. Okay. I love it. And, and I mean, <laughs> look, so I, I went to the website and I'm a picky guy. So I used to, uh, I used to, and still do, yeah, I'm a designer. So I usually pick websites apart. The, the website itself, just for the conference, it's gorgeous. It's so well put together. I was completely impressed, and I had nothing bad to say about the website. And normally, I'm like picking people's websites apart. I'm like, oh my God, they, I just, this menu is terrible. The header is ugly, but it's just, it's a really, really well put together website. So if that's any clue or indication to how cool this event is going to be, you know, it, it, it looks like it's going to be top tier, really fun, really engaging, really cool. And it's super modern, too. So, um, you know, some of the, the, the speakers and the performers are, are already up. You can see who's going to be there and who's. Uh, could you give the people at home uh, the web address real quick or can we throw it up on bottom of the screen? Yeah, it's HopeConferenceGA.com. HopeConferenceGA.com. They can also follow us on Instagram at HopeConferenceGA to stay up to date with all info that's coming in for the conference. All right, awesome. And now, if for, for someone like me who's out of town, I'm based in New York, how can I be a part of the festival? Like, Is there a, a live stream or is it just check it out you know, on the website? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be live streaming. And so you'll be able to tune in to our website and uh, Facebook Live. And so you'll be able to catch it. Now, we've already had people inquire from, you know, uh, other states asking, hey, I'm not going to be there physically. Can I watch? Y'all going to be streaming it. So, yes, we will. And uh, so you can tune in that way. All right. Awesome. Now, there are are, are there any, um, you know, charities or local charities that you guys have attached to this thing? Or is it just, you know, the church itself? No, it's uh, really cool, um, and that's what the the Hope Run is going to be helping to uh, uh, raise money for. Uh, something called Feed the City, 
Okay. Uh, that happens every November, the Saturday just before Thanksgiving, uh, where we give turkeys, we give bags of food to families. Basically, everything you need to prepare a Thanksgiving meal, uh, they are given that. And so um, we've fed over, uh, just since 1997, we've been able to feed over uh, 100,000 people just wow. through uh, Feed the City. So we're That's going amazing. strong, and uh, Hope Conference is going to help meet that need. So Feed the City is going to be the organization we're going to be supporting. All right, this is amazing. Uh, people at home, please, if you're in the Georgia area, check out the website. Go check out Pastor Jordan Poole and the Hope Conference. If I was there, I'd be there. It sounds like a bunch of fun. Uh, right now, I want to go ahead and throw it back to Pastor Corey and let him wrap up his sermon. In Matthew 16, Jesus is telling people who want to follow him, he says, if you want to gain or you want to save your life, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It sounds like he's being contradictory, but this is the very principle he's speaking to. He's saying, if you make it about you and you pursue your gains and your happiness, you're actually going to lose your life. But if you will make your life about losing it, invest it on me, invest it on my kingdom, invest it on others, you will actually gain it and you will find a secret uh, uh, success to satisfaction and, and fulfillment and happiness and identity and that, self, that ever elusive self-esteem. But it's completely counterintuitive. For those of us who are parents, our kids need us to give them compasses more than we need to give them happiness. We need to shape, we need to give them moral compasses, and, and, and we need to teach them how to become adults who can contribute to society. In fact, when happiness is the goal, it almost always becomes elusive and is almost always disappointing. If happiness is the goal, because here's the thing about happiness, it's circumstantial and it's momentary. We've all seen this, right? Um, you're behind that wonderful family in the line at Target or Publix, and the three-year-old decides, decides, now is the time I will lose my mind. <laughs> and the mom is like, could we just do this anywhere else? And you feel for the mom. And, it's, and, and, and in, their, in the moment, we forget that we're preparing them for a game, and we've probably all done it. So if you've done it, you're in good company because we're all broken people who keep re-meeting Jesus every day. We say that every week. Uh, but in that moment, they say, honey, and I, I just saw this not that long ago. I'm like, oh, don't. Uh, it says, honey, if you will please just stop screaming, I will give you whatever you want. And I'm like, don't! Why? Because what we're saying is, if you act crazy enough, I will reward you with whatever you want versus understand that there's an equation that if you do this, I will do this. And so what happens is that we make happiness the goal and the kid is happy because they just got promised they get to go watch um, the Star Wars, Clone Wars show that they want to watch at home, and they got a sucker in their mouth. Well, the problem is two minutes later, they also decide they don't want to get in the van. Now, happiness is gone. It's out the window. It's elusive. It's like, I thought we just did this in Target. <laughs> Instead, we have to train them that there are, that for every action, there's a consequence, both good and bad. Happiness is not a good goal. Um, however, happiness is a wonderful byproduct of identifying your gifts this is true for all of us. Happiness is a byproduct of identifying your gifts and using them to serve others, contribute to society, and make the world a better place. And that is what God has put us on the planet to do. When you do these things, when you, when you make your life about other people, happiness sneaks up on you. And so maybe you're here and you, you find yourself going, oh my gosh, pastor, like I don't even mean to do that, but I'm doing that help. What, what's something I can do? For those of you who maybe feel like, oh, this is God inspiring you to, to maybe make a tweak, just, I want to give you one simple practical thing you can do in the next near foreseeable future. You, with your children, spend some time helping them to discover or identify either a gift or a resource that they currently have, and then find a way that they can use that gift or resource to serve someone else, and then you join them in it. So whether it's money or whether it's time or whether it's a skill that they have, help them identify and say, hey, what's something you have that we could do to bless or invest or serve someone else? And then you join them and you do it and you just see what happens. All right, that was Pastor Corey. Demo, we're going to get back to more Ambo TV, but right now we're going to take a quick commercial break. When the devil attacks you, shake it off. He shook it off into the fire. It didn't say he wasn't attacked because we think that, that as long as we're following Jesus, we're never attacked. No, he got bit, but he chose to shake it off 
into the fire. All right, there's Pastor Dustin Barker. And as we do at the end of every show, I like to ask our guests really quickly just to give us a Bible passage that pertains to the quick clip, the, the quick clip rather that we just watched. So, uh, Pastor Jordan Poole, can you give uh, the viewers at home, you know, a Bible passage that they, that they can go to about uh, resisting the devil? Absolutely. James four and seven says, "Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you." I like to say it this way: Resist the devil, don't assist the devil. Align yourself with God's word. Let him order your steps, and you'll come out better than before. All right, I love it. That's amazing. Resist the devil. Do not assist the devil. This is words of wisdom from Pastor Jordan Poole. Pastor Jordan Poole, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, man. It was a pleasure. Right, Enjoyed awesome. it, man. And thank you to all of our partnering churches, Mountain Lake Church with Pastor Nathan, Elevation Point with Pastor Dustin, and Cape Christian Church with Pastor Corey, and of course, Hope Church with Pastor Jordan. Thanks for those powerful messages. To see the complete sermons and other great sermons, head over to AmboTV.com. We always have great content for you there. And thank you all for watching Ambo TV. Remember to join us again every Monday and Thursday at 11 p.m. Good night, and I can't wait to see you next week. God bless.